Well, first of all, Mariam, I just want to thank you for being here. And I am so glad that you are here. There was some time that there was some uncertainty about whether Mariam would be able to join us today. And I would like to start with that. Um, Mariam, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what happened. You have not been living in Bahrain for the last three years, is that right? Um, but you did go back to visit your father who is imprisoned as a political activist there. Tell us what happened. Um, so first of all, I'm really happy to be here and thank you all for coming here today. Um, it was, let's see, it was the end of August and my father had just started his, I think, third hunger strike uh, in, in protest of arbitrary, continued arbitrary detentions in Bahrain. As a human rights defender, my father his entire life has dedicated, has been dedicated to the struggle of human rights and uh, promoting human rights in Bahrain and in other countries around the region. And so being in prison, sentenced to life, he felt stripped of all the tools that he used to have as a human rights defender. And so hunger strike became his only tool. His own body became his only tool to continue protesting the violations committed by the Bahraini government. And so he embarked on this hunger strike, and at the end of uh, August, I met with e a hunger strike expert who was very familiar with my father's case. And he told me that given my dad's health issues due to the torture that he had endured, but also to former hunger strikes that he had been on, which had lasted more than 100 days, um, he was at risk of heart failure at any point. Um, and so given that I hadn't seen my father in almost two years, I decided to pack my bags and go back to Bahrain from Denmark where I had been living uh, in, you know, trying to see him if, if it happened to be the last time. <clears throat> so I went to Bahrain. I had previously been denied boarding on British Airways trying to go to Bahrain on order of the Bahraini government. And so I didn't even know if I was going to make it on the flight. But I did, and I reached Bahrain. I was held at the airport assaulted uh, by the police, and then thrown in prison for 19 days after I was charged with assaulting the same police officers who had assaulted me. Uh, even though I made a point publicly to the police that I would not raise a finger even if they did assault me. Um, due to international pressure, I was then released and allowed to leave the country a week later after my travel ban had been lifted. Um, but of course my father, my sister, and my uncle still remain in prison today. And you were finally able to see your father though? Yes, so while I was in prison, two weeks after I went to prison, um, I had continuously made uh, requests to go visit my father or to at least speak to him on the phone. He was still on hunger strike and his life was at risk. Um, and I think that was the most difficult part about being in prison was that I was so close to him, but I couldn't see him. So I embarked on my own hunger strike, demanding that I be allowed to see him. And four days after my hunger strike and due to the international attention that my hunger strike got, uh, they allowed me to see my father finally. So I want to go back to 2011. Um, this was a time that so many countries in the Middle East were just in flames, it seemed. Um, we heard a lot about some of those countries, and we did not hear very much about Bahrain. You know, Egypt, I think, was on, at the forefront of a lot of Americans' minds. Um, there was fascination with Libya, with Tunisia. Bahrain's a fairly small country, and that might be the reason why. But I'd like to know, I mean, when, when this happened, starting in February of, of 2011, why do you think that the outside world may not have been as knowledgeable about what was happening in Bahrain? I think for several reasons. Like you mentioned, Bahrain is a very, very small country. I think it's about 3.5 times the size of Washington, D.C. Uh, it has a population of citizens between 600 and 700,000 people. Um, so it's, it's quite small. Uh, and usually when people do know about Bahrain, it's because Michael Jackson lived there for a little while before he passed away, uh, or because of the Formula One race. Um, but also there are other reasons why there were many governments who did not want people talking about Bahrain. Uh, I, I usually call Bahrain the inconvenient revolution. It's inconvenient to the Arabs, it's inconvenient to the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and others. But it's also inconvenient to, co to countries like the United States and the United Kingdom um, for many reasons, some of them being that the US Fifth Fleet is based in Bahrain. Um, and because of um, economic relations and security relations that the US and the UK and some of the other Western countries have with the Bahraini government. And so it was in everyone's best interest to not speak 
about Bahrain to make sure that there wasn't too much international awareness and support for the movement in Bahrain. I mean, are you suggesting that the international media were complicit in that? I think to some extent. Uh, there was, in 2011, there was a huge debacle with someone quitting the CNN because they had done an entire documentary called I Revolution that was supposed to be aired on CNN, but then got taken down um, after it had a Bahrain section in it. Uh, and the same thing with the Arab media. The Arab media, of course, don't cover Bahrain almost at all. And when they do, they do it in a, on very sectarian terms. Um, for example, Al Jazeera English did a documentary called Shouting in the Dark about Bahrain. Uh, and it was aired twice before it was taken down uh, by Al Jazeera because the Bahraini government made such a huge fuss about it. And so there are many different reasons. But I think also another reason is that the Bahraini government is quite smart and has a lot of money. And so Bahrain is one of the only countries I know of who, between 2011 and now, have employed more than 13 public relations companies to do their work for them internationally to try and better their image and to also keep themselves out of the local and the international press. How, yeah, how, can you talk a little more? How have you seen that play out, this international PR you know, strategy? Well, many different ways. I mean, we see a lot of articles in international press that praises the Bahraini government for being reformist and progressive. Um, they also do a lot of events where they try to promote themselves as, you know, the beacon of democracy in the, in the Middle East, and especially in the monarchies of the Middle East. Um, and so, for example, they hosted an event uh, called This is Bahrain in London just a few months ago, uh, where they talked about how open Bahrain was and how it, you know, respected uh, religious minorities. Of course, not mentioning that the biggest uh, religious group in Bahrain is actually under a constant crackdown. Um, so they, they have many different methodologies where they make videos, where they host events, where they take part in international events like sporting events. For example, the Formula One has been used as a huge PR spin for Bahrain, where every year they host the Formula One and talk about how open Bahrain is and invite everyone to come and attend you know, this fun festivity um, around the Formula One that happens. So given the you know, thinness of old media coverage of what happened and what's currently happening in Bahrain. What has been the role of new media? During, and let's start with the actual uprising. I mean, you, I checked this morning, have 102,000 Twitter followers, and that really increased during the uprising, right? Uh, yes, I think actually pretty much most of it happened after the uprising. Ah, okay. I didn't have too many followers before then. Um, I think I gained the... Mm, Majority of my followers won through that one tweet that I tweeted in 2011, which basically said, we are being attacked. Uh, and suddenly, I had hundreds of new followers uh, coming to my account. Um, and this was during the time in February 2011 when people were sleeping in the roundabout, and they were attacked by police forces while they were sleeping. This is the, the Pearl Roundabout, which had a monument at that time um, of basically a pearl held up by is it four arms or five. five arms? And that ended up sort of being the epicenter of the uprising. Exactly. It was basically referred to as the Tahrir Square of Bahrain. Yeah. Um, and so that one tweet really got a lot of attention. And then, of course, during my imprisonment, um, and this is something that the governments don't do very well. They, they don't seem to understand that the more they imprison activists, the more they crack down on activists, the more following they get, uh, the more they become known. And so that, those were the two times that I garnered the most uh, following on Twitter. Um, but I think the, you know, social media has played such a massive role, not just in Bahrain, but in the revolutions in general. And it's for many different reasons, of course. The thing is, is I don't agree with calling them the Twitter or the Facebook revolutions. I think that Twitter and Facebook were tools that were used by the youth for the revolutions. These were the youth revolutions, the revolutions for dignity. Um, and because it was very difficult to get through to the old type media, that youth, the youth had that to find their own ways, their own tools of get, getting the information out there. And so they turned to things like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and it was for many different things. For example, it was for organizing protests. And so when people wanted to organize protests, they would do it through Twitter and Facebook. It was for documenting the human rights violations that were happening. I mean, even for us as human rights defenders, Having Twitter is sort of like having a whole lot of interns working with you while you're doing your work. 
And so, for example, if I'm working on a report on the demolishing of mosques in Bahrain that happened in 2011, all I have to do is send out 140 characters asking people to send me videos and pictures of that, and suddenly I'll have hundreds of responses doing that for me, so I don't have to do the work myself. Uh, but then also, you know, to tell people what's going on while it's going on. And I think that's also something that's really changed the face of media, is that you don't need to wait for that breaking news from that international, you know, huge media channel. But rather, you can be online following the very same people who are being shot, who are being killed, who are being attacked while it's happening. And it's made, I think, to some extent, it's made the movements and the revolution so much more real even if you're sitting you know, across oceans from where it's happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder what your take is on this. I have wondered, throughout the Middle East, these uprisings started with a younger generation. And I wonder if social media tools were not available to them, would they have happened at all? You know, if, let's say, Facebook and Twitter came you know, when we were older and it was our children who were using them as tools, would we have just you know, continued as our parents did under the regime, and then it would be our children who would, who would start, you know, start the uprising? I mean, I guess I'm trying to find out, was it something special about this generation of youth, you know, that this moment was the moment for them? Or would th was this inevitable with the tools of technology that they had available? I think both. Both um, explanations can be argued for. Um, my opinion is that they would have happened anyway. Because, I mean, if we take Bahrain as an example, Bahrain has one of the oldest civil rights movements in the region. It's, we've had an uprising almost every 10 years since the 1920s. And so the last uprising in Bahrain wasn't 40, 50 years ago. It was in the 1990s, um, where people rose up and demanded that they have a constitution that actually represents the people and a parliament that actually has legislative and monitoring powers, which it didn't have. Um, so I think these things were going to happen. It's just that Twitter and Facebook and social media in general became the tool of the revolution. Um, that being said, I think a good example of why I think it would have happened anyway was when Mubarak shut off the internet in Egypt. And he thought shutting off the internet would actually be a tool for him to try and stop the protests from happening, but it had the exact opposite response. People could no longer sit on their couch and you know, follow what's happening in the street in Egypt. They had to go out and check for themselves. And so shutting off the internet could have been just about the worst mistake Mubarak made because it forced people out of their homes and onto the streets. And you had a surge in the amount of people on the streets during those days when there was a social media or internet blackout. And that's why I think Bahrain and Syria, seeing what happened in Egypt, decided not to do the same. They did not shut off the internet during the height of the protests. Mm. So I, I guess following on that, um, if this generation would have done it anyway, why? I mean, what, what, what is different about their experience that made this the time that the issues they were raising needed to be addressed? Were they experiencing anything different from what their parents had experienced at that age? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's a different situation in each country. Um, in Bahrain, it was that in 2001, people were promised a constitutional monarchy. And the, you know, the emir at that point, and then he named himself king and made Bahrain a kingdom. But the emir at that point promised people the beautiful days we had yet to live. And he promised them a return to the 73 constitution. Um, and then he went back on those promises, and he didn't deliver on them. And in 2010, we started again having situation of systematic torture and political arrests and you know kangaroo courts. And so people were already getting into the, into the situation where they needed to have another uprising. And if we look at the framework of the, time, the timeline, it was actually exactly 10 years after the last uprising. And so within Bahraini timeline, it was about time for another uprising. Uh, in Egypt, of course, we saw the case of um, Khalid, uh, what was his name? Uh, the young man who was tortured to death. Mm. Uh, and there was a leak of the video of him being tortured to death. And that's what got p the youth moving, saying, well, we can't accept this. We can't watch people being tortured to death and sit at home and do nothing about it. Um, and that's when they started taking to the streets. And t Tunisia was the lack of dignity. And I think it was, it's really the issue of dignity that sparked these revolutions. It's not that there weren't, and I think it would be unfair to even say, that there was, you know, these revolutions came out of nowhere. 
it's not true because a lot of people usually when they talk about what is called the Arab Spring, and I don't like that term, but what is called the Arab Spring, they talk about it as if it was an awakening. People were asleep and suddenly woke up or that you know nobody expected this to happen. It came out of nowhere. And I disagree with that. We have civil societies in all of these countries who were working very hard at trying to make this happen and who put their lives on the line when no one else would, when no one else was paying attention to try and create that awareness within the societies, both in Egypt and Tunisia and Bahrain and Syria and so many different places. And so it was just that one spark that was needed that would set it off. And it was when al Azizi was slapped by the police officer who knew that he would not be held accountable. And that indignified manner of treatment that Arab citizens are subjected to almost on a daily basis in their countries, uh, that's what sparked it. It was Bouazizi saying, I can't handle this. You know, I can't handle someone being able to treat me like this and get away with it. So he set himself on fire. And so that's basically what sparked these revolutions. And it was something, again, I don't think that the revolutions caused each other. I don't think that Tunisia caused Egypt and then Egypt caused Yemen and Yemen caused Bahrain. I think they inspired each other. Because in every one of these countries, they had the very same reasons to take to the streets, whether it was absolute power, corruption, the daily violations, the torture, the imprisonment, and it's a long list. And so it was just that suddenly they went from a position where there was almost some sense of hopelessness, that you, know, you can never change the status quo, into watching Tunisia and Bin Ali fleeing in such a short period and saying, well, wait, if we take to the streets, maybe we can create a change. Maybe we can force these governments uh, you know, to, to step down if the people demand it. And I think that's what really sparked it. It was the lack of dignity to begin with, but then so many other social and political issues. When you were talking about the Constitution, this hope that the Constitution would be changed in Bahrain, I think I'd like to hear a little bit more about you know, this dichotomy there seems to be between what is on paper in Bahrain when it comes to the rule of law and the rights of, of, of citizens versus you know, what you're describing, the day-to-day the day -day life there. I think um, perhaps one of the reasons that people in the West weren't paying much attention to Bahrain in the run-up to the 2011 uprising was that on paper, Bahrain actually appears to be a fairly progressive country. Um, can you tell me a little bit about sort of what what it is that you weren't actually seeing in terms of the human rights that by law you were supposed to have um, and what the reality actually was living there? Well, I mean, that's, that would be a very long list and I don't want to bore you with it, but I'll give you a few examples. Um, first of all, when people took to the streets in Bahrain, just like in Syria, they weren't asking for the stepping down of the regime. They were asking for reforms. And it was the same thing in Syria. People were asking for reforms. Um, and the government's response was to fire, fire you know, their weapons and kill people on the streets. And that's when it turned from a demand to, for reforms into a demand that the entire regime steps down. And the type of reforms they were asking for? Well, in Bahrain, it was more specifically to the constitution. And the re reason for this was that in 2001, when the emir took over, uh, he promised a return to the 73 constitution. The 73 constitution guaranteed the people of Bahrain a parliament that was actually representative and that had legislative and monitoring powers. And so he came out and made that promise and that's why people supported him when he first took power. 2002, he unilaterally changed the constitution of 73, uh, making himself above the constitution, uh, naming himself king and Bahrain a kingdom. But then, I mean, the Constitution in itself does have some positive things in it. Like you said, on paper, it might actually look pretty good. But he was still above the Constitution, which meant that he could uh, control the way that the Constitution was implemented, but also the way the Constitution was in general. And so that was a huge problem. Um, and so despite the promises that he made, he went back on that. The, he created a parliament that has no legislative or monitoring powers. The gerrymandering in Bahrain is so ridiculous that even if the opposition got 60% of the votes, they can only get 18 out of 40 seats in parliament. And that's at a time when the, when the parliament doesn't even have power. So the fact that they would even try to limit the opposition seats at a time when they couldn't change anything, even if they were um, you know, the majority in the house, uh, shows you to what extent the Bahraini government is afraid of giving people powers. Um, but even on the very basic level of freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of, um, of uh, you know, assembly, these things were not allowed. If people went out and tried to protest, they'd be beaten and thrown in prison. If they tried to speak out and criticize the government, 
they, again, they'd be beaten and thrown in prison. And this was happening over and over and over again. The one thing that the Bahraini government did well is employ all of these Western PR companies who told them how to do things and pay lip service to their allies to make themselves look really good. And so one of the things that the Bahraini government did was, uh, one, they appointed a Jewish female ambassador to the United States to show how progressive they are. And they appointed a Christian woman uh, as ambassador to the UK. And that really got them you know, that positive uh, response from Western countries as in being very, very, pro for an Arab country in the Gulf to appoint these kind of ambassadors was a huge issue. Uh, the fact that they respected religious, ri religious minority rights. So you have temples for Buddhists and Christians and so on inside Bahrain. What is not talked about is that 74% of the population who are Shia are systematically discriminated against, uh, who are not allowed to work certain jobs. There are certain areas in Bahrain where they're not allowed to live. Um, and so there's this massive difference between what the situation is and what things that they were using to promote themselves as being very progressive. And the problem is that uh, within Western countries, they quickly latched on to that lip service and the kind of things that the Bahraini government was doing to promote themselves as being progressive. And so the Crown Prince, for example, studied and graduated from the American University in DC. And so he was seen as, you know, at the forefront, an emblem of reform and progress in, in the region, not just in Bahrain. And he still, to some extent, they still try to promote him as being that. Even now, after the, all of the crackdown, after all of the violations, the US government, to some extent, still tries to promote him as being the progressive guy in the government. And so it was this understanding by the Bahraini authorities of how to play around with the different things they do, appointing female ministers, for example. At the same time, that local woman had no real rights where they were being discriminated against, where they were being targeted. But then, you know, you, having that, um, what's it called? The, um, basically uh, employing women into top positions and saying, well, look, we have women ministers. Look, they don't even wear the hijab. They're very, very progressive. You know, that those women that everyone would look at and be like, wow, in an Arab country for that to happen, they must be really, really progressive. Mm -hmm. So what's changed since 2011? Uh, I would say just about everything. I mean, we've gone from a position where the Bahraini government was doing a really good job at promoting itself as the beacon of democracy in the Middle East and North Africa, even though they were the furthest thing from it, into a situation where they're trying to cover up their daily human rights violations. Um, and they're still doing a pretty good job of, uh, on, that, on that front as well, to be honest. Um, it's become more and more difficult for Bahrain's allies, namely the United Kingdom and the United States, to keep saying that Bahrain is the beacon of democracy. Um, the U.S. does a better job at not trying to cover it up than the U.K. does. I mean, if you look, just in comparison, just this year, if you look at the U.S. State Department's human rights report on Bahrain, and you look at the U.K.'s human rights report on Bahrain from the government, it's as if they're talking about two different countries. Hmm. You know, the U.S. Prom the U.S. actually brought up a lot of the very real issues that Bahrain is facing when it comes to human rights in regards to the daily ongoing violations, even though U.S. foreign policy doesn't actually address those issues, but at least they mentioned it in their report. The UK goes to the extent of not only not recognizing the human rights problems, but actually trying to whitewash a lot of the problems and the ongoing human rights issues that Bahrain is facing. And I think, you know, to a large extent, it's this lack of international accountability that creates the situation where the Bahraini government can continue today to commit the very same violations, which have now become institutionalized, that they were committing in 2011. So do you think the U.S. should be more involved in the human rights struggle in Bahrain? Well, I think that the, that the U.S. government is involved, whether we like it or not. I mean, one of the questions I get a lot from um, people inside Bahrain, but also from people around the region is, well, if you don't like U.S. government policies, why do you keep meeting with the White House? And why do you keep meeting with Congress and State Department, which I do every couple of months? And I told them, because whether we like it or not, the U.S. has a foreign policy on Bahrain. And they are involved in Bahrain. My job is trying to make it a positive influence rather than a negative one. Um, the current situation is, is that the United States government and the UK government are enabling a lot of the uh, situation that is currently ongoing inside the country. So what I'm trying to do is trying to push the UK and the US government in upholding their responsibilities towards human rights um, you know, internationally towards Bahrain. Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, when we want to question whether certain governments who say that human rights and democracy are the cornerstone of their foreign policy, 
we're not going to judge them based on how well they upheld Iran towards those standards, because we know they already do that. We're going to be asking, well, how uh, successful were you, or how did you even uh, try to implement these standards towards your own allies, which they're not doing. I think it says a lot about the United States government when they choose to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to the human rights situation in Bahrain, but then you know comes out and talks about Syria and Iran and the situation there, which they should. But Bahrain shouldn't be given a free pass because they're a U.S. ally and because the Fifth Fleet is there. So I think you know when it comes to U.S. policy on Bahrain, nobody wants a military intervention. And I don't think, and I haven't heard anyone from Bahrain saying, well, the U.S. government should come and free the people of Bahrain from the Bahraini government. Not at all. The Bahraini people are more than capable of fighting for their rights. What they need is for the U.S. government and the U.K. government to stop enabling human rights violations inside the country and to uphold international accountability on the very basic levels. For example, the, the banning of selling of arms sales uh, to the Bahraini government. For example, the individual sanctions against people who are known as human rights violators. When you have the king's son personally implicated in torture cases, where we have testimonies from political prisoners who were tortured at the hands of the king's son, then coming to Florida to take part in the Iron Man race, you know, with absolutely no accountability. That's why these violations happen in Bahrain. When you have the Bahraini military who carried out a lot of these violations, doing training with the US military here on US soil, that's a problem. And so I think at the very basic levels when we talk about accountability towards human rights violations, even that is not happening when we're talking about Bahrain. One thing you mentioned in a previous answer was that the largest Muslim population within Bahrain is, is perhaps the most oppressed. Um, you're talking about the Shia. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to sort of tease apart this, going back to this issue of the youth and how you know this movement really in 2011 started with the youth. Um, what I'm interested in is, I think I saw this with, with in Egypt as well. Um, the, the youth had sort of this post-religious, post-sectarian unity. Um, and what they were calling for were sort of like secular changes um, that would benefit all sectors of, of, the, of the population. And it sounded like that's certainly how things were, at least at the beginning, in Bahrain as well. Um, but in the month or so of the uprising, we started to see some sectarian clashes in some parts of Bahrain. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of this hope of like post-sectarian improvements in a country? I mean, was that, was that sort of a mirage that there's a generation of people that might be past all of that? I mean, is this, are these real tensions that are are going to continue and perhaps get in the way of reforms. Well, I think you know, like you mentioned, the you know the fact that the youth were non-sectarian was one of the biggest threats to these regimes. What these regimes do best is divide and conquer, uh, and they've been doing it for a long time. To talk about the sectarian issue in Bahrain, you have to go just a little bit back. The like I mentioned in Bahrain, we have one of the oldest civil rights movements that started in the 1920s. And in the 1950s, all of these uprisings that happened in Bahrain were a mixture of the different sects, but also of the different political um, ideologies. So for example, in the 1950s, we had an uprising that was led by the Arab nationalists, um, which was a mixture also of Shia and Sunni, people from the society. And I think that's when, that was when the Bahraini government or the regime realized that this was the biggest threat to them, was the unity of the Bahraini people. Because the Al-Khalifa family themselves are not originally from Bahrain. They took over Bahrain by force 230 years ago, and they've been ruling it by force since then. Um, and so in the 1950s, when that uprising happened, Bahrain was still a British protectorate. And so it was the British who came into Bahrain and stopped the uprising. The Sunni leaders were sent to St. Helena Island, and the Shia leaders were sent into exile to Iraq and Iran. Since then, we've seen an ongoing policy of driving sectarianism within the society. And that's where it comes to the thing that I was talking about, that hap that, about the discrimination uh, against the Shia population in Bahrain. It didn't happen you know, because it just happened. It happened because there was actually a constructed plan by the government to drive this kind of sectarian wedge between the population. And so the reason why, for example, you have areas where Shias are not allowed to live was because they wanted to create that very real living 
separation between the two sects. I mean, before it was an unwritten law that Shias were not allowed to live in certain areas. Now if you go to Bahrain, Ali is known as a Shia neighborhood. Rafah is known as a Sunni neighborhood. Since 2011, they've actually set up a wall between the two areas so that people cannot travel back and forth. So basically and literally setting up a separation between the two sects uh, within the country as well. 2006, there was the Bandergate scandal. The Bandergate scandal was basically a leaking of uh, dozens and dozens of government papers and documents that proved that there was a group that was created within the government for the mere purpose of creating a sectarian problem within the society. And this was massive. I mean, this was something that was talked about for a very long time. And you can still find it online if you look for it. So, so you really believe that if these, um, you know, if, if sectarian discord weren't being fanned by the government, that it would go away? Well, it might not go away completely, but I think the reason why it exists the way it does today is because of the regimes. I mean, if we look at 2011, right? So 2011, people came out into the streets and nobody cared about whether you were Sunni or Shia or otherwise. I remember there were a lot of people who called themselves Sushis because they're half Sunni, half Shia, you know, in the protests. Um, and so it was, it was basically a space where everyone came together. And one of the main slogans that was used during the demonstrations when I was personally there was, no Sunni, no Shia, only Bahraini. Now what happened since then is that the government said, okay, this is a problem for us. And so the crackdown that happened starting March 2011 was almost completely focused on sectarianism. And so the target of the crackdown wasn't the protesters, it was the Shia. They demolished more than 30 Shia mosques. Some of them date back to before the Al Khalifas took over Bahrain. And so they're very historical buildings that had a lot of importance, historical importance for Bahrain, uh, but also religious importance. And then they set up checkpoints. And the crackdown was done in a way to basically create a situation where if you were Shia, you were a target. And it was done for two purposes. One, to send a very strong message to the Sunni community in Bahrain, you're either with us or you get treated like the Shias. And so this forced a lot of the people in the Sunni community to say, well, you know, I'd, I'd rather not get involved in this because there's such a heavy price to pay if we do. Um, and the second thing was the Bahraini government is smart enough to know that if they can um, construct the crackdown in a way where it looks like it was a Shia uprising rather than a Bahraini uprising, within the media framework, immediately when you think Shia, the words that come to your mind are Iran and Hezbollah. And so it would, for them, serve as some sort of justification for the crackdown because, of course, Iran and Hezbollah are sort of the boogeyman in the region. And so for them to even just, you know, and this is something that they were successful in doing. I mean, you rarely find an article in international media about Bahrain that doesn't start with the Shia uprising against the Sunni monarchy. It's always, you know, brought in the terms of sectarianism, even though it wasn't. Um, and I would actually disagree with you. There weren't any sectarian clashes in Bahrain. Even in December in 2011, when uh, there was attacks by uh, civilian clo clothes thug, thugs uh, that worked for the government, they started attacking religious processions that belonged to the Shia. It was the Sunnis of that community that came out and protected the Shias from the thugs. And so there, there was still, and despite everything that the government is doing, they still are having a hard time in creating the sectarian situation that they want. But we saw this in other places. I mean, in every country where you had revolutions, the government tried to do that. In Egypt, they tried to say, well, this is the Muslims versus the Copts. This is not about you know, political reform and pol political and human rights and so on. No, 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 this is a fight between the Muslims and the Copts, and we're here to separate the two. You know, we're, we're the West's best bet at staying stable. In Syria, Bashar al-Assad did a very good job at creating this framework that this is Sunni versus Alawite. It's not about human rights and democracy. And so this is something that we've seen over and over again used by these regimes. And they, of course, created a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you drive that sectarian wedge or that religious wedge, usually you end up creating that very, that very situation that you were talking about. So then of the countries that went through this tumult in 2011, have any of them sort of delivered on the promise in your mind? I mean, are, are any of these countries ones that you can look to and, said, and say, if we just could get it right, we could be that country right now? I think the best example of success is Tunisia right now. Uh, they still have a lot of issues to work on, um, especially accountability for the police and the Minister of Interior and for the officials that belong to the old Ben Ali regime. 
Um, but that being said, the fact that they have elections, the fact that they were able to change from a Muslim Brotherhood government into a more secular government, I think it says a lot about how they've been able to progress. Not so much in other countries. Yeah. I mean, when we're talking about Egypt, the military did such a good job at taking over. Um, and basically garnering the public uh, opinion and public um, support that they needed to do what they did. I mean, the coup that they did against the Muslim Brotherhood. And the thing is, I think it was really inspiring to see the Egyptian people take to the streets again when they didn't like what the Muslim Brotherhood was doing. And one of the best examples I've heard, or best ways of explaining it that I heard from an Egyptian activist, was that you know when you see someone telling you that they're making a vanilla cake and they keep putting chocolate in it, you don't wait until the cake is out of the oven to do something about it. And that's why people took to the streets to demand a change from the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a great thing. But at the same time, for the military to then step in and do the coup and take over, and then the Rab'a massacre, which I think is horrendous that we don't actually talk about. The fact that people were killed on the streets, hundreds of people were killed on the streets for merely being members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And I disagree with just about everything the Muslim Brotherhood stands for. It doesn't mean that I think they should be killed, and especially without accountability. Um, I think that the military did a really good job in you know, regaining control. And the military, if we look at 2011 when they were in control, the amount of human rights violations that happen under the military are even worse than under the Mubarak regime. And it's still the case today. And I think it's horrific that countries like the United States continue their relationship with the military despite everything. The military, the arms sales, you know, the diplomatic relations, and so on. There hasn't been any kind of accountability for the Egyptian regime. Syria, I don't really need to talk about. I'm sure everyone here knows how horrific the situation is. But I think the, one of the most heartbreaking things about the, what is called the Arab Spring is that because of the lack of international support, and I'm talking on diplomatic grounds from governments, the lack of international support for the nonviolent movements that all of these countries started out with. I mean, Yemen, they have guns in almost every household in Yemen. People chose to leave their guns at home and go out and be nonviolent. But the lack of international government supports for these movements is the reason why we're seeing what we're seeing in the, in the region today, especially in regards to extremism, to terrorism growing, and all of these different issues that we're facing now. So are you saying that if there had been more international support for the protesters against uh, former President Mohamed Morsi, for example, in Egypt, that we wouldn't have seen the military take over again, or, or what? I think it would have been more difficult for the military to take over. If there was actual support for civil society under Morsi uh, that allowed them to hold the Morsi uh, government accountable, uh, to stop Morsi from trying to change the constitution where he gives himself more powers, uh, which was one of the biggest problems with his government. I think that the situation w could have been quite different from what it is right now. I think in Syria, when Bashar al-Assad started to do what he did, um, and you know, constantly we saw attempts of holding him accountable shot down by places like Russia, uh, and the kind of military support that he received from places like Iran, and of course then the involvement of Hezbollah is what created the platform for ISIS to grow. Because the Syrian people don't want terrorism. The Syrian people wanted democracy and human rights. And Syria has always been a place where people coexisted. Sunnis, Shias, Christians, and so on. Why is it that now suddenly we're seeing this amount of sectarianism growing? And part of it is the Iranian Hezbollah influence in the country, but also part, a large part of it is the funding that the Gulf countries did for extremist armed groups within the country. And so of course we are where we are. It only makes sense when you have, the, instead of support for nonviolent activism and for civil society, we have a situation where these governments actually supported and even at times funded extremist groups who were more willing to pick up guns and kill people than fight nonviolently for reforms and progress. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll open it up to the audience questions. But what is the current state of the protest movement in Bahrain? Um, we're pretty much in the same situation. We still have protests almost on a daily basis. Uh, they're quickly attacked, of course, by the police. Um, we have one of the largest per capita political prisoners uh, in the region. I think it's the second largest per capita in the Middle East and North Africa, we have about 3,000 to 4,000 political prisoners in prison right now. 
Um, but I think what's changed from 2011 to now in Bahrain is that the crackdown has become institutionalized. The main tool that's used right now is the judiciary against people. And so we have almost every day trials um, against people who are either protested or spoke out or tweeted uh, about different issues in Bahrain. And you can get sentenced up to 15 years in prison for protesting um, or for going out on the streets or for speaking your mind. But it, like I said, it's become a lot more institutionalized. The decrees that have been issued by the king, like for example, prior to this year, if you insulted the king, whether on Twitter or publicly, you could face a two to six month, up to one year imprisonment sentence. In February this year, the king passed an amendment to the law that now says if you insult the king, you are minimum facing one year imprisonment, maximum seven years with a $37,000 fine. And so we're now again and again seeing people going to prison on charges of insulting the king. And that could be basically anything. You know, you saying that you don't like the king could be an insult. Um, so very draconian, very backward type uh, you know, uh, amendments that are happening to the law and basically institutionalizing the crackdown. So I think we have two microphones that will be in the audience. And you have a question if you can raise your hand and Gabe and I will come around with the mic. Is that a raised hand? Okay. Uh, thank you for your work. Um, what, what suggestions would you have to human rights activists here in this country? Are we taking another question or should I respond? No, you should respond. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I think that there's a lot that can be done within the United States. Uh, one of the things that is a little problematic for Bahraini civil society is that our diaspora is so tiny. Uh, we have a very tiny population and almost non-existent diaspora. So it's not like Egypt where you had hundreds of thousands of people around the world who could support the movement. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to work on is creating social support within the countries where your vote actually matters. That's one thing that you guys have that people don't have in the Middle East. And so calling up members of Congress, writing them letters, I've actually met with members of Congress who they actually asked for meetings with me because their constituents were calling them, asking them what they were doing about Bahrain. And so they were actually sought me out for meetings to be able to respond to their constituents. So that really helps. Uh, talking to the White House, writing letters, calling in, asking what they're doing about Bahrain, saying that you don't like their policy on Bahrain is also very helpful. Creating awareness. I think one of the things like you know that was mentioning is that we don't have too many people who know about what's going on in Bahrain. And so even the simplest task of creating awareness is very important. And I was you know, talking to a group of students a while back, and I told them showing solidarity with movements these days is so much simpler than it used to be, where you can you be sitting in the comfort of your own home and send out 140 characters saying that you support the movement of a people or that you support a specific political prisoner and so, and so on. And we have many of those. And so Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, all these other organizations constantly do campaigns for political prisoners and prisoners of conscience inside Bahrain that people here can support as well. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done from the US to help support um, human rights in Bahrain. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate all, we all appreciate your work and thank you for coming to Chicago even though it's so cold. But speaking because it's so cold here, how did you select Denmark as a place to live? What were the reasons behind that? <laughs> well, thank you for that question. Um, I've actually been to Chicago before and I must say I was still surprised by how cold it was when I got here. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm actually a Danish citizen. Uh, my father has been a human rights defender all of his life. Uh, my mother was an activist as well. They were both forced to flee Bahrain uh, in the late 1970s uh, during that uprising. And so they sought political asylum in Denmark, uh, where I grew up for the first 14 years of my life. So I, the first time I ever saw Bahrain was when I was 14 years old in 2001, when my family was allowed to go back from exile to Bahrain. Um, and that's why, of course, when I left Bahrain, uh, Denmark was the most appropriate place for me to go, given that I have citizenship there. Thank you, Sister Maria. May God bless you. You gave a lot of information that I didn't know in detail. Thank you. May Allah, may God bless all of the brothers and sisters that they came over here. They are social conscious. God bless you. 
all of you. But most important, sister, I think that uh, you may touch it for some reason you didn't. It is the question of oil and the military base. Before America had the military base, Britain had the military base. And because of oil companies, they run everything. Weapon companies, military base, Seventh Fleet, is the most important, powerful organization, companies, multi-billion companies, that are running the whole world. And you show me any country that has a wealth, oil, and located in a very sophisticated, important place like the Middle East, and then United States, especially European countries, they have great amount of interest in there to keep them going. Doesn't matter how many people get killed. In this country, they want to have a, they want to have their own way. They send American soldiers to Iraq. They are getting Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, but they end up in Iraq. Why? They had the oil. Same things, oil and weapon. That is the unfortunately our brothers and sisters right in this country, they have to wake up, speak up. Speak up, speak up, speak up. Unfortunately, we cannot play game around in here. They are taking advantage, I'm, I'm sorry, most of the majority, I can say, American people are kept most oppressed people because of non-information. System, all of the networks. Can I ask her, sir? Yes. Okay, can you please ask her? My question is that, sister. When you are mentioning the, your point of views, please touch the, all the main problems that this country does not involve. This country, in one week, can change your country. Can we, can can change we have everything. Mariam respond? Would you please, yeah. I'm asking why you are not mentioning the biggest problem that is facing your country, which I faced in my country, in Iran, we fought. The oil companies told them, oil companies, please leave, do not support Shah of Iran. That happened. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think we did touch a little bit on the issue of the Fifth Fleet <clears throat> and how Western allies actually turn a blind eye to the situation in Bahrain. I think the issue of oil is important. Uh, Bahrain doesn't have much oil left. Most of the oil that it has comes from Saudi Arabia. Uh, but it does work as a refinery for oil coming from Saudi Arabia. So it is an important issue. Um, one of the main problems as well with Bahrain is that it comes in a collective. When people took to the streets of Bahrain, they knew that they weren't fighting one government. They were fighting six governments, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Um, and so that's why I think another reason why it's so difficult for us and it's such an uphill struggle to get governments like the United States and the United Kingdom to take a better position on human rights in Bahrain is because they're very worried about you know, upsetting the Saudis and the Emiratis, not just the Bahrainis. That being said, um, when we're talking about the, the oil situation, there are so many different issues that can be brought up, brought up, of course. I mean, one of the issues that I thought was very interesting was how outraged everyone has been about the beheadings that have been committed by ISIS in Iraq and Syria, which people should be. It is a horrendous situation. But yet, we rarely hear people speaking out or being outraged by the beheadings in Saudi Arabia, which actually surpassed the number of beheadings done by ISIS. And to a large extent, it's because it's state-sanctioned beheadings in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is an ally to the West. And so we'd rather not talk about the beheadings of Saudi Arabia, but let's talk about the beheadings of ISIS. And the fact that now Saudi Arabia is actually a part of the alliance that is fighting ISIS, when they actually commit a lot of crimes and human rights violations themselves. Um, so I think, yes, oil is very important. A lot of people are analyzing that this might change in the near future, given that the United States, to some extent, is becoming self-sufficient when it comes to oil, uh, and also because they have other places to get it from. I know that in the past week, there's been an issue and a large conversation about the drop in oil prices and how that's going to affect the region. Um, so definitely the oil question comes into, into the picture when we're talking about the Middle East in general, not just about Bahrain. But I think also one of the most important things, which you also touched upon, is the arms sales. 
Um, I mean, Prince Andrew of the UK was in Bahrain earlier this year trying to sell fighter jets to the Bahraini king at a time when people are still being cracked down upon inside the country. And so it's, it's, not just, it's not just, I think, limited to the issue of oil and oil sales around the world, but it's, it goes far beyond that into the relationship, the geopolitical importance of Bahrain, first of all, and how close they are to Iran and to other countries, but also the issue of arms sales. Saudi Arabia, I believe, is the first or second largest buyer of arms in the United States. They buy all of these arms that they don't even know how to use because they know that this will you know, create a good relationship for them and good influence within the US government. Um, so I think there's, like you said, there are a lot of issues that should come into question, should come up in discussion when we talk about the Middle East and the North Africa region and why the United States for such a long time has had the wrong foreign policy. And you know, when I meet with US government officials, I tell them that, I tell them that um, if you were, when you look at it from a short term perspective, it might make sense to continue supporting dictatorships who you can depend on because it looks like that's going to be the best outcome for your foreign policy. But if you start thinking just a little bit more long term, you'll see that you're actually shooting yourself in the foot when you continue to support dictatorships in a situation which has become increasingly unstable and where, and it's not if, it's when people actually come to the point where they self-rule, self-govern, they will not look with a friendly eye towards the United States or the UK or the West in general because they will see them as having enabled the dictatorships that continue to rule in their countries. And so I think there's a lot of issues, you know, When we're talking about the Middle East, there's a lot of issues that do need to be brought up into the conversation. If you want to take a last question on your side, this will be our last question for this program. Thank you again for coming and speaking to us. My question is about social media as a platform. Certainly media and civil rights, the American civil rights movement, it's been huge in sort of shaping um, movements. Um, my concern with, with um, social media is as more and more people get involved and grassroots grow, um, does it in any way dilute, not, not dilute the message, but does a certain fatigue set in? For example, we saw so many images in Hong Kong and now, you know, where did that go? So how do you, certainly it's important for mobilizing and grassroots, but when it comes time to pressing for demands, how do you regain that focus so that someone because you were saying, for example, that the responses become institutionalized, it just brings everything down to lower levels. How do you press then and get the real change? Thank you for that question. Um, I think that social media to some extent is a double-edged sword. Uh, there's a lot of pros, but there's also a lot of cons. One of the cons I would say is the fact that we've become so saturated with images of killings and torture that to some extent people don't respond to it the same way anymore. You know, oh, another person tortured to death in Syria, oh, I've seen that before. You know, another child that was killed in barrel bombing, I've seen that before. And so to some extent, our reaction dies down because of the amount of horrific videos and pictures that we've seen over the past four years. Um, that being said, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, the more we learn about how to use social media as a tool, it's not like the governments are stuck back in 2011. The governments are also learning how to use social media as a tool of counter-revolution. And so uh, actually Odette and I were discussing this right before the event. The Syrian and the Bahraini governments, I would say, did the best job in creating online counter-revolution uh, methodologies. And so for example, defamation and attacking activists online, trying to get whatever they can to discredit activists uh, internationally. Um, threats, issuing threats against, I mean, I've had countless number of death threats, rape threats, whatever kind of threats you want to think of, I probably got it. Um, trying to paint people as being, as working for different governments. Uh, for example, I've been, you know, accused of working from everyone from the CIA to the Mossad to the Iranian government. You have it. Um, so they've also started using social media as their own tools of counter-revolution. So how is it that you regain the balance? I mean, one of the things that I think is a lot of people are trying to battle now is how ISIS is using Twitter and Facebook as a means of recruiting people, uh, which is becoming also very, very, very problematic, as well as you know issuing all these videos and so on, trying to show people what they're capable of. So like I said, it's a double-edged sword. One thing that we try to do is 
or I, what I think is good about Twitter is that it connects people across borders. And so, for example, I work with human rights defenders in Syria and Egypt and Yemen and Morocco and all these different places. I mean, in Egypt, most of them are in prison now, and in Syria, most of them are missing. But the fact that it opened up you know, our platforms to becoming more regional rather than very specifically um, focused on being local, it did make a difference. And it's, again, it's very difficult, but we try to use it as a way of fighting sectarianism as well. Like one of the things that we've been doing a lot is I speak a lot with and take pictures with Syrian activists. And one of the things that, that people usually bring up when they're talking about Bahrain or Syria is that you're either for this or this, you can't be both. You either like the Saudi or the Iranian regime, you can't like both, or you're against one, you can't do both. And so one of the things that we do is try to bring down these stereotypes. So when I take a picture with a Syrian activist and we're like, we both support the Syrian and the Bahraini revolution. We don't like the Iranian government or the Syrian government. Suddenly people are like, wait, 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 you're, you're not fitting into my stereotypes anymore. This doesn't make sense. And so we use Twitter and social media to do things like that as well. It's becoming more and more difficult, I must say. I mean, with Twitter, people also have shorter attention spans. And so one of the things that the Bahraini government has learned is that if you can take the first uh, reactions of arresting someone that's high profile, but if you can you know, live that out and allow it to happen, usually within three, four months, people forget. And then that's when you can sentence them for a very long time. And we've seen this happen in Bahrain. Nabir Rajab is one of the whole, uh, most high profile people in Bahrain as an activist. And he was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison for a tweet. Um, and in the beginning, there was a huge response internationally to his case. But after a couple of months, people started forgetting about it. And so these governments also are learning how to use social media and how to deal with social media, which is, to some extent, becoming more and more of an uphill struggle for us as well. Um, so like I said, it's a double-edged sword, and we just have to keep trying. OK. Thank you.